Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Uh, very warm greetings to uh, each of you. Welcome to DBA Scholar Leaders Webinar. Today's event is the third round of Scholar Leaders Webinar, namely supply chain management in post-COVID disruption in the year of uh, 2022. I'm Dr. Tara Chung, the chairman of the PolyU DBA Alumni Association Limited, DBAAA. It is my pleasure to be a moderator for this webinar. On behalf of the organizer, Business School of the Hong Kong Polytechnic University and PolyU DBAAA, we extend our appreciation for your presence today. All of us are experiencing an age of disruption triggered by a number of factors uh, like uh, geopolitical conflicts, COVID-19, etc. In response to such challenges, uh, some sharing from reaching the business and academics in the areas of the knowledge application, exchange and transfer may contribute a better preparation. One of the hot topics in an age of disruption is supply chain management in post-COVID disruption. Uh, without further ado, let us start our today's event by welcoming our representative of Poly UDB program, Dr. Brian Kay. Uh, Brian is also our DBA alumni. Uh, he will deliver his opening remarks. Please welcome Dr. Brian Kay. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Derek Chung. Uh, let me share my screen. I have uh, two slides to share. Okay. Um, and uh, Professor Wilson Tom, he is our program director. The fact faculty is gratefully like uh, like to work with DPAA for, for these years and DPAA has been very su uh, support uh, to the school and we joined, force, uh, joined our forces to promote poly youth and uh, faculty of businesses and our programs. So today's topic is a great topic is about uh, the disruptions of uh, COVID uh, and then how it impact our businesses and operations and especially today, uh, we talk about supply chain management. COVID is interrupting our way of we how we communicate, how we carry the businesses. And such as I'm right now, I'm quarantined at home and we can still support this event virtually, right? And today we have two great speakers and one of them is my DBA cohort, Dr. Manaj. Hello, Manaj. Hello. Uh, it's nice to see you uh, again, you know, for, for all these years, you know, we have been uh, 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 learning together, studying together, and th this is, it was a wonderful journey uh, of our DPA program. So part, prior uh, to their sharing, may I give some background ab about our Poly UDBA, DPA program. Uh, Poly UDBA program was launched in 1996, and it has the longest history in the region. The program aims to educate senior executives to be the scholar leaders who will be able to apply research thinking skills in solving their real world businesses and management problems. Sharing as a graduate from this program, you will also have this unusual opportunity to build strong bonding with your cohorts. Who are the business leaders? And through this DBA education journey in the next two to three years time, you will tap into an amazingly, amazingly resources which could bring your career or your businesses into a higher level, okay? The final call for this ap for the application is now on. So please talk to our graduates or our colleagues um, as one of your uh, takeaways, okay? And let me share the next screen uh, so that you could, right, okay. Okay, that's all I have and just let me unshare my screen. Um, right, let me just stop here.
Thank you. And I pass the stage uh, to the speakers, of course. Thanks. Uh, thanks for Dr. Brian Case uh, sharing. Um, well, right now we are going to introduce our distinguished speakers today. Um, they are Professor Yulen Wang and uh, Dr. Manat. And uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Wang first. Professor Wang is currently a full professor of the Department of the Logistics and Marine Time um, Studies at the Faculty of Business of the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. She received her PhD degree in Business Administration from Duke University. She obtained both her BS and MS degrees from Shanghai Zhejiang uh, University. Her research work has been published in leading academic journals such as Management Science, Operations Research, Manufacturing and Service Operations Management, and Production and Operations Management. Dr. Wong's research interests include operation and supply chain management, sustainability operations, behavioral operations management, operations IS marketing interface, and platform economy. She served as a senior editor of production and operations management and associate editor of decision science and media. She is an editorial advisory board member of Transportation Research Park E. And uh, Dr. Manot's uh, experience of more than three decades in global supply chain management and doctorate in strategic sourcing, it is a combination of business and academic worlds with panel commercial multicultural exposure with focus on innovation and integration. He is currently working as head of corporate supply chain for Johnson Electric Hong Kong the leader in micro motors and motion subsystems. He has worked in all areas of supply chain management of engineering manufacturing companies in Asia, Europe, and Americas. His main expertise is in establishing supply chain offices from scratch or converting them in an efficient organization for domestic companies as well as, as, well as MNCs in, media, in India, China. His focus areas are supply chain digitalization, sustainability, risk management, supply chain finance, global commodity management, and strategic sourcing. Today, uh, Dr. Manol would like to cover foreign topics, disruptions in supply chains and supply chain networks, VUCA, volatile, uncertainty, complex, and ambiguous well, inflation in commodity market, shortage of semiconductors, logistic port lockdown, backlog, container waste, how to deal in such VUCA environment. May we have uh, Manat uh, as the first guest speaker today? Okay. Thank you, Derek and Brian for introduction and thanks a lot for you for giving me this opportunity. Mm, I will share my screen. Okay, I hope everyone can see my screen. So today's my topic is managing supply chain in VUCA world. VUCA is volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. If you see the x-axis where availability of information about situation or event, we have the information available. And on the y-axis, if you see the predictability of the impact of risk, what is going to happen further? The right corner, right top corner, in case of volatility, you have information and you can predict. But in case of ambiguity, it's totally opposite. You don't have much knowledge about information about the current situation, and you cannot predict also. Complexity and uncertainty have, again, different characteristics. So let us go one by one to understand these four terms. Let's start with material inflation. I have come from automotive manufacturing industry and engineering industry. So 
the background or references will be from those industries. But those are applicable for all aspects of life. Now, considering inflation, major key metals like copper, aluminium, steel, they have inflated over 100% in last two years. For example, copper rate two years back was around 5,000 and then it reached to 10,000. Now it is settling to 7,800 or 7,900. But the inflation is so high. Rare earth based metals. Rare earth is very important commodity now. Uh, just to give you background, rare earths are used in many applications and the main applications are they are used in electric vehicle components as well as a lot of manufactured engineering products. And those prices of rare earth also increased by 200% in 18 months. We will come back to rare earth after some time again. Steel or silicon steel which is used in our motors. Again, inflation is 100% in last 18 months. Plastic resins. I have given here four examples, PA66 or nylon 66 or PA6, nylon 6 is commonly used material in engineering industry that has inflated as well as flame retardant PBT or polypropylene specific grades, those also inflated. And if you compare the China or Europe or America, region wise also inflation. So it's the global phenomenon, every region, the materials, all types of materials are inflated. If you move a little bit to transportation industry, fuel cost. Now, vessel low sulfur fuel oil. Low sulfur fuel oil is becoming critical because from 1st January 2020, it is mandatory how much sulfur can be in the fuel oil. And those prices also went up by May 20. Take example of truck diesel. This chart is for USA. And you can see in 2021 start, the price of fuel or uh, truck diesel, which was around $4 per gallon, by May 22, it crossed $6 per gallon. Another example is ocean freight rates. There are two maps on this chart. Left side is for America, right side is of Europe. And suppose you consider the container sending from China to USA, West Coast. Prices used to be contract $3,000, which changed to $9,000. And if you have to buy spot, $14,000 per container. Same thing about East Coast also. Prices are not much different. $3,500 container started to cost $11,000 and the spot reached to $14,000. Same for European side also. So ocean freight rates also increased by 200% and spot rates by 350%. This is called volatility. Volatility is the changes. These are dynamic, rapid, frequent, significant, and those are not stable. You have data, information, probability, or impact of risk may be known. Predictions and estimations are feasible, but not easy. What used to happen till two years back, we used to have the trades. And you can estimate to some extent what is going to be future if you know the critical success factors affecting the event. But post COVID-19, everything has changed. Volatility is so much, you cannot predict. Turbulence in the market, fluctuations in the demand. There are rapid changes in material availability. And because of that, commodity prices are going up. Major currencies are fluctuating, so financial market is also highly volatile. And this leads to risk, instability, and fluxes. In our case, you can see every chart has at the end some blue highlighted writing. That is my personal experience. Inflation throughout the supply chains. Substantial significant price increases in raw materials, copper, steel, plastic, rare earth, I mentioned, ocean freight rate, air freight rate, trucking charges correspondingly. So this is about volatility. We will little move to another dimension. See, for supply chain, particularly global supply chain, disruptions are not new. August 2007, great big global financial crisis 
and then there was snowstorms, volcano, earthquakes, natural disasters, and uh, other events also affected like uh, Olympics or university games in China, then port strikes. But December 2019, and from Jan 2020, COVID-19 disruption is really, really I'll give you some examples. Multiple lockdowns due to COVID-19, everybody has experienced in different states, cities, countries. At the same time, what was happening, steel production was slowed down in Japan and China because of demand was reduced. Everything locked down, no demand, steel production reduced, and many glass furnaces were shut down. Now, the thing is, once the blast furnace is shut down, it takes time to restart. So your supply chain gets affected that way. Political disputes and government policies. Uh, in June, July 2021, during that period, there was conflict between USA and China. And because of that, China government restricted export of rare earth metal. And that because of that, rare earth metal prices skyrocketed. There were seven largest rare earth metal mining companies in China. Consolidation was there, done. The prices were controlled. And rare earth metal becomes too expensive. Similar thing happened for Australia-China dispute. And in China, the coal is importing from Australia. There are some other commodities also they import, but from industrial purpose. Now, this coal is used for steel manufacturing. And because of this, one is the scarcity of coal, energy production leading to power stresses, and at the same time, steel production got affected in China. The next part is the natural disasters. In 2021 in Texas, there was the record low temperature and winter storm. And this was the single costliest natural disaster in USA. Of course, because of climate change. Now, uh, the damage was, I think, around 195 billion US dollars to that extent. Now, in this Texas area, there are semiconductors companies called Samsung, NXP, Infineon, electronics industry situated there. It got affected. Their production stopped. Another industry is plastic seed chemicals. And multiple days production was stopped like polyethylene 75% production stock, PVC 57%, polypropylene 62% for number of days, and total supply chain got disturbed. After that, July 2021, again because of climate change, extreme rainfall, Europe has floodings, Germany and Western Europe, and all transportation got disturbed. Then there are social events like a Beijing Winter Olympics. Because of that, multiple industries and suppliers around that were shut down. Then question of material arising. Material like cobalt, which is used for lithium-ion batteries, demand went up and did not have that much material. So again, shortages. If you come to the transportation side, you can see the left side photo. This is the anti -anthro. You may know Yantian port is world's fourth largest port. And there are 100 ships per week. Because of five few crew members aboard container ship docked at the port found positive for COVID, the port was locked. All activities were stopped and ships started to accommodate there. Another example, this photo is very famous in Suez Canal, where 50 ships per day, that is the what the traffic is. And because of this ever given ship, 20,000 TU container ship, it was blocked and six or seven days, nothing can, nothing could. War and lockdown. Now, Russian invasion of Ukraine, there are multiple and multiple effects on that. It leads to banned and longer trading routes. Then there is a shortage of crude oil, natural gas, coal, aluminum, wheat which comes from Russia. And today also there is a severe problem of energy. Energy cost is going up, particularly in Germany, not enough energy. 
In case of Shanghai, what happened in March 2022? Again, there was a lockdown for five to six weeks. Everyone was at home. Suppliers in Shanghai and nearby faced severe restrictions on production, logistic arrangement, and commercial activities. This is called uncertainty. Changes are unknown. Future is unclear. Now, cause and effect relationship of the risk event is predictable, but other supporting information is not available. Details of impact severity arising from the event may be available. Probability of risk is unknown, and long-term outcomes we can't predict. What is going to happen after Ukraine war? How many years we will have different impacts? Nobody knows. Effects are shut down, blockages, direction paralyzed. We don't know what to do. Material shortage, struggle with customer demand forecast. Customer cannot forecast, and manufacturer cannot plan. And there is an extra cost for managing supply chain, especially supply chain risk. Again, we'll come to the semiconductor. Now, semiconductor process. This is the process which is so complex. The production lead time is 45 to 60 days. But now, the supply state. Lead time for supply, 16 weeks, increased to 52 to 70 weeks. Still, today also I am struggling to get semiconductors. I have to book for next two years. Why that happened? Again, global pandemic. Then global vapor shortage was there. Then, in between fire incidents, in case of one Japanese automotive semiconductor manufacturer, Texas snowstorm I just mentioned, and Taiwan water crisis. Lockdown, everything gets multiplied. This is called the complexity. Coming to the port lockdown and blockages, these are the three photos of the ports: Shenzhen, Los Angeles, and Shanghai ports. This is the complexity in transportation: vessels waiting for anchoring in docks for a number of days, and this is affecting production. Increasing transit time affects inventory. Complexity in inventory management. Because transit time is increasing, you don't know how much inventory to keep, and inventory management becomes complex. Again, this complexity has really lot of dimensions. At one end, there is a supply chain; other ends, the environment, global economies, and societies. We have detail complexity, the changing complexity, and in the value chain, at the downstream side, complexity, supplier side, upstream complexity, customer side. And within manufacturing, you have number of processes. Then it becomes your operation becomes complex. So what is the complexity? Multiple of issues and factors, situation and event, interconnected, interlinked variables, components. Some information is available. Impact can predict, but relationship between atoms and people difficult to understand because so many atoms are there. Actions and results are interlinked. So one action affects many reasons. So effect will be confusion, difficulty in understanding, complication, delays in decision making, and productivity reduces, inventory increases, duality is created. No complexity due to unique regulatory rules, tariffs, and sanctions is another issue. United States, Mexico, Canada agreement or conflict mineral reporting template. This creates further complexity. Complexity due to supply chain footprints. Suppose you have many manufacturing locations across multiple countries, it is further adding complexity. And lastly, ambiguity. Now this is interesting piece. What happened in our plant? Uh, our we have a plant near Shenzhen, and one day we came to know, oh, material found uh, COVID affected. The material had come outside China, and we used to test it, and it was. Covid affected. Now, how to do that? How to tackle that? Nobody was knew. So there was no, there was a confusion. There was no clear process. There was no clear guideline. Facilities were not there. So we set up then whole thing like disinfection, CCTVs, partition, isolation areas, staging areas. So this is whole ambiguity during that point. Another example of ambiguity is borders between countries blocked. Hong Kong Shenzhen blocked, or Hong Kong borders are blocked, and I know, I think everybody knows. On WhatsApp, we are talking every time, every day, like how many days quarantine, and what are the criteria, 
whether I have to do quarantine for three days or seven days or in home, at home, in the hotel. So this whole ambiguity. In case of transit or transportation, the reliability transit remains at record low. Simple example, China to USA used to be, we used to say 40 days is the lead time for material from China to USA. After COVID, it's become so difficult to predict. It can go up to 70 days or 75 days. And nobody can tell, I may get material on 14th day, 40th day, or I may get material on 17th day. And then what to do if I get material on 40th day, my inventory will be more. If on the 70th day, I will have the shortage. So that is the ambiguity. So ambiguity is lack of clarity in interpretation. Casual relation between causes and effects are unclear. Probability of risk and impact arising from it is unknown. So unknown and unknowns. And no prior experience for making predictions. External trades, external opportunities, you cannot abstract. So lack of information leads to doubts, distrust, decision-making difficult. Sometimes the roles and responsibilities not clear. No information on public domain. And sometimes because of changes in external environment, rules and regulation changes. So all are these effects. So this is about volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. With this, how to manage it? I'll go quickly in all four. All four can be managed in a different way with different focuses. I will quickly go through those. Volatility is first basic thing is you have to anticipate, predict, and react to change. Understand the triggers and indicators. I will give you one example. For example, copper price. We have data of 50 years. There is a trade. And from that trade, I can predict, and the current situation, I can predict the what will be the copper price in future. And I can hedge the commodity price of copper. So I am hedging copper price with bank for next six to seven years. Regular reviews required for that. Logical and sequential risk analysis we have to see. Every time you have to take new viewpoint, develop robust realistic framework. In case of this copper hedging only, we have to take care of legal requirement also because we have the audit. Auditor will audit that. I don't have to do the market speculation. So I can't hedge at any price. We have to have all the backups for that. Outcome bullwhip effect, overcome bullwhip effect, we have to avoid that in case of volatility. So we say volatility can be avoided by avoiding non-linear areas. What is non-linear areas? Volatile material, where the prices are fluctuating, don't select that material in your product. Select the material where prices generally remain standard or not very much. You can have material pass through clause, Miss supplier is asking you to increase the price. You can increase, give that, transfer that increase to customer. You can make contract design like that, dual sourcing. In case of freight and logistic, you can have input terms, FCA, streamline and re-engineer warehousing and distribution procedures. Hedging, I already mentioned. So this is the way you can manage volatility. Uncertainty. Now, uncertainty again has triggers, indicators you try to understand. But main important is the responsiveness in controlling and monitoring. Act decisively, timely. Seek new viewpoints more time to time, from time to time. Prioritize, allocate resources for preparedness. And then other parties, quality control assurance, product design, supply chain redesign, lean thinking, these are the things. But uncertainty, to some extent can be controlled moving from reactive to proactive. Digitalization, flexible planning, strengthening supply chain visibility or supply chain agility enhancement is there. Strategic sourcing, sustainability, su sustainable supply chain management, sustainable logistics, reduction in cycle time, lead time based on. Complexity is another factor and that can be done by simplicity, simplification of supply chain, standardization, restructuring. Build proper backup system. Now you can standardize material, simplify processes, digital transformation. You should have data visualization because a lot of data is there in complexity. ERP and SCM systems. You can have dual source strategy, global versus local supplier base. Ambiguity. 
ambiguity for that you require accurate and correct interpretation understanding across business process concrete vision visibility of internal external factors clarity as much as possible clarity in directional approach is required and you can have connecting end to end supply chain collaboration integration of business and operational strategies mid process by strategies should be clear in such case and you can reduce ambiguity now which skill sets are required in buka world for volatility you should be agile future orientation there should be transparency and clear communication complexity you should have problem solving decision making data analysis you have to do uncertainty long term vision you should have you should be clear about your goal you should be technology centric problem solving ambiguity accountability you should take the accountability you should be innovative good communication and clarity in thinking overall you should have systematic vision for change continuous learning and holistic approach so role of supply chain leadership in buka three things are required for this i will not go into much details because uh, i think we have the time also we have to see but three things are first thing you should have vision as a leader you should be clear what you want second is leadership people skills you have to train people and third is collaboration communication these three qualities are very much required for uh, leader in this buka i am coming back to this chart because if in one word we have to say volatility you should have vision uncertainty you should have understanding complexity you should have clarity and ambiguity is agility you should react immediately and this is the last slide how to have success in buka world first is you take consider this as opportunity and sustainable competitive competitive advantage use buka futures for that. second is partnership networking mapping increase transparency and visibility you must be innovative and creative ready for change willing to change then emerging technologies digitization ai supply chain analytics you have to use restructure and reengineer logistics improve your service quality and develop sustainable and resi resi resilient supply chain management in summary this is the game of knowledge knowledge management it will drive information flow performance and if your information flow performance is very good it will yield to supply chain performance which will ultimately give very good business performance so let us successfully live with the buka world thank you uh thanks for uh, dr manoj uh, to come to uh, tani uh, in giving us uh, such excellent presentation and uh, enlighten us well if any audience uh, have questions uh, please uh, send me or administrator a note okay uh, now it is the turn of uh, professor yunan wang uh, her shared topic is responsive responsible and resilient supply chain management during and after covid 19 uh okay so thanks derek uh, i think uh, manoi maybe shall you first stop sharing your slide <laughs> yeah sorry okay sure thank you yes i stopped okay let me share mine so can you see my slides yes we can okay great Okay, so good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen, uh, students, friends, colleagues. Uh, I see some uh, familiar faces uh, here, and some I do not know. So today is my really great, great pleasure to be here to share a few thoughts, um, personal thoughts, on supply chain management during and after COVID nineteen. So I think in the past decades. Uh, so uh, let me first say something. I think my view may sometimes echo what Manoi just said before. So you will see some collection between his talk and mine. So I hope this gives you a full picture how the supply chain management is uh, kind of reminding itself during and after COVID-19. So past decades, globalization has needs to have very complex interdependency between the supply chain partners. Especially, we have a very lengthy supply chain 
due to the global sourcing and the companies are specialized in certain areas and certain technology and certain expertise. As a result, you look at stuff like chain network, we have a very deep tiering system and the unprecedented global scale. So this is a scale issue. In the meantime, what we face in reality is in a 2020, we have COVID-19, which is suddenly on strikes. And this is a disruption we haven't seen for century in the sense of its global level. So what is the minority said like earthquakes, tsunamis, uh, worker strikes, fires, it's all international, regional, but here we are something no one can escape. Everybody is affected. Suddenly the companies who can respond quickly, react, readjust its production process, relocate its potential partners, and then continue supply will survive all this crisis. So if they look at the, in the COVID, we know many things like, you know, we need the PPE, invaded vaccine, and all this need a sound supply chain under nine to make things going. So it's become a very important determinant of the company's performance indicator. And the supply chain officers sometimes it suddenly become the toughest job in the state's weight. And it, moreover, the industry is actually now calling for, you know, managers or decision makers with knowledge about supply chain management. So I know finance is very fancy, sexy term, and most are MBA, DBA students, and most students really want to choose a job in finance. But actually, I think uh, COVID is like a wake up call for the knowledge in supply chain management. There are definitely, I was talking with my colleagues in the US, as they see a big demanding or more and more people now is want to have some major or specialization in supply chain management. So I think it's some good uh, things for our discipline. So next, uh, I'll actually want to first talk about the impact of COVID-19 from uh, two aspects, macro and micro. And after that, I will see how we react from the three R's, which I was talking in my uh, talk title. So uh, two impacts on the um, macro level, I think it's social and economic. Uh, I think majority actually have very, very good slides about the inflation of prices and many things. Uh, this, and I, this issue is that COVID-19 is not just like a large global scale, right? Which we never seen in century. It's also the long last in the time. Such a long time, it's already like two and a half years, right? We are still in the pandemic. Everybody still, we don't know when it will stop. Uh, such a kind of non-lasting global scale pandemic actually very restrained the recovery of our production process. So we see various uh, shortages of components and products and it's driving the prices go up. So there's an uh, inflation pressure. So if you look at the bottom chart here, uh, this is uh, from the UK Office for National Statistics. You can see COVID-19, right? Uh, and they be before it strike, uh, they, CPIH inflation index is around 2% and now it goes to 8%. Uh, Makes things worse, early on this year, we have the Ukraine-Russia war. Uh, unfortunately, for supply chain is really bad news in the sense that these two uh, countries are one of the biggest players in the world for exporting the energy and the food. And we know from, as a supply chain manager, you probably know energy and food are mostly essential ingredients in almost all the supply chains. We will consume them in this way or not, then another way. So as a result, the kind of supply shock definitely will further press the price up and we have uh, like inflation pressure. So this is what I'm in economic. Socially, COVID also have a big impact on our health and the neighbor for supply. If you probably heard the term like post-COVID syndrome or long COVID. So as a result, it's really uh, changing people's health as well as the availability of labor um, labor supply. As a result, you see there's something very ironic, right? Very conflicting with each other. So here's a picture on the left. You see uh, early this year entry is taken. There's a fleet of containers full of stuff uh, floating at the sea. While on the other hand, you see at the uh, shop, there is empty shelf where I'm, there is nothing to sell. So what really makes things uh, worse is because we are in shortage of the, uh, you know, the workers and the port and drivers to deliver. So, and uh, another bad news about this, which means some people are not able to work. So 
Then the impact on societies will see an enlarged uh, wealth disparity and income inequality in the society, and those will affect the arc, uh, accessibility as well. So looking at those macro issues, this will make the supply chain more interesting. If we know the economic social impact, so how we should redesign our product, our process to mitigate social kind of you know social and economic issue. So that's the macro impact I want to talk about. So next, I want to talk about the micro issue from the supply chain angles. So if you have taken a course some related with supply chain or operations management, you will probably know our discipline is related to how to make supply meet the demand, right? So now I will look at macro, micro issue from the supply and demand side to let you have a picture of supply chain. So impact of COVID in the digital demand side is like a, it's really changing our consumers' lifestyle and habit. So big, due to COVID, many people now stay home and they enter kind of rethink a bank about what our life is. And we see enter now more and more consumers are survey about the consumer behavior and it shows that more and more consumers have become ESG conscious. They are cost incentive because, you know, there is like, you know, people are unemployed. And they also more care about the health and they become loyal to the brands, they trust and believe. So, and then based on those customer behavior, the question to the supply chain managers, how we, shall we redesign our product line? Shall we working more harder to reduce cost? So what kind of product shall we reassort? So then say one question we want to think about. And second one is uh, for the shopping habits, more and more consumers are switching to online, especially due to the COVID's uh, many uh, social uh, distancing rules. So, and this definitely will affect the supply chain distribution network redesign. And now currently worldwide, there are around a quarter of the world population are shopping online. In some places and regions, this number is much bigger so if you know in China, it's 64%, in the US is 77%, while in the EU is 74%. So then this will have a big uh, issue for the supply chain management is shall we redesign our distribution system and redesign our marketing uh, strategy correspondingly, right? So, and uh, worse enough is we know if you just study marketing, we know once consumer change their habit, it's not like short term. It probably have long-term impact, a uh, consumer has inertia issue. So this process may be irreversible. So we definitely have to take those demands that change into thinking about managing our supply chain. Well, on the supply side, so I want to point out some things. So COVID, as I just mentioned before, and also as you see the slides from Lamloy, it is really at a large global scale. So the disruption is not like a, a very uh, regional, national, or provincial. It's a system disruption. It is a snowball effect across the chain, up and downstream the whole channel. So then actually, when COVID happened, a real excellent company should do how I first identify where is a broken chain, right? Where, where the, net, the net or the knot, the chain is broken, and then work around these broken uh, louts or links to rebound back. And then you, as quickly as you, as you can to rebound back, you can mitigate all the disruption. However, the fact, the reality is very sad. So if you are according to the 2018 Deloitte survey, actually most, most our procurement supply chain manager, they have no idea about their supply chain network. So 65% of uh, the procurement manager and she have very limited or even no visibility beyond this, their tier one supplier, which is one just next to them. And their supplier suppliers, they never know. And uh, when these strikes, uh, COVID strikes in 2020, there is a, the most things for companies uh, is they need to find, right, who is affected. Unfortunately, 70% of the respondents saying, uh, managers in companies that respond, that they are just trying, they are trying to identify where is their su supplier? Are they located in the lockdown areas? Such due to invisibility, such process may take weeks to you know to you know to identify and find out. Then you take action and solutions. But you know, due to the supply chains, you know the the whole network, the co uh, interdependence. Uh, I'm just mentioned before. Once the broken chain, you cannot fix it, and the source. 
then disruption will spread out both upstream and downstream. And this is, and moreover, this effect is amplified itself due to delay, lengthen, and the congestion, everything goes up. Then it will become very hard and it will take much, much longer months for you to recover and rebounce back. So such a kind of systematic disruption and a chain amplified effect really call two things for the supply chain. One is the call for the sub supply network mapping. So to able to respond, entry re requires the company to have a digital twin, which means that physical mapping of what your physical supply chain network is really working, they have the digital twin about it. Then we have, can have the full transparency and visibility of our whole entire chain. And then we know if there are some country regulation requirements, how we can react and meet. And second one, we need to do the proactive risk management. And we have such kind of mindset, we need to be prepared and do this. So we can, on the digital twin, once you have this network mapping, you probably should offer or perform certain scenario planning and simulation and do the risk planning as well. And there's one book I will refer you to read if you have time, it's called Managing Supply Chain Risk. So, so now we see the impact, uh, effect of the COVID both at the macro and micro level. So from those things we say, I think uh, to make a, re, a supply chain to go healthy, then we should have three R. So the first one I'm talking about is responsive. The supply chain need to be responsive. Uh, how to be responsive? So let us think again. Let's think from a supply chain viewpoint. So what I'm talking about, the first one, responsive from the demand side, we need to be customer centric. So in the COVID, right, we see the customer habit change, especially the digital transformation from offline to online. So now after COVID, one and more company definitely will adopt the omnichannel bricks and clicks operation. And in the bricks and uh, uh, clicks operations, one thing is uh, the way the good side is you will get a lot of data of about the consumers, their shopping, their browsing, etc. And you can still using the apply the big data or not analytics uh, techniques to do smart retailing, like algorithmic retailing. So which is now actually used by many companies like JD, or Amazon, etc. I also can talk about one manufacturing example. The picture maybe here is very little bit small, but let me talk about it here. This company called a Coric Dr. Piper. One of their products they are selling is a brewer, coffee brewer. So in each coffee brewer they sell, they actually have a embedded a Wi-Fi enabled smart ID. So by and the West Coast uh, consumers uh log in and up in this program, then the company can continuously monitors the consumer's usage and the handmade consumption, et cetera. And such data tracking actually can help the consumer, or can help the company, Dr. Piper, to do the financial forecasting, to make the planning of our production schedule, delivery schedule, route schedule, infantry planning as well. So that's all. This is something I want to talk. But there's one side uh, effect about bricks and clicks operation, especially when you move online, most of the consumer buy things without knowing the product. They cannot touch, they cannot feel. So, so the return rate through online shopping is much higher than the brick and the brick and mortar uh, mode. So the call for the supply chain manager is uh, how to manage the return. And you know, if you don't manage them well, there's a big waste. It's not sustainable, it's not green. So some company like Amazon, right? What are they doing is uh, for the returns, they actually will check or do a quality inspection. And for those eligible good ones, maybe customer returns because they misfit. As I said, they cannot feel and touch. It's not quality problem, but misfit problem. Then they will refill those uh, returns as meal. So, and uh, so this is definitely one solution. Other solutions really, uh, you should can sell to it, for example, to the uh, discount chain, et cetera, which I will not go into details here. Second one, uh, for, from the, this is from the demand side, be responsive. From the supply side, be responsive, we need to do the agile manufacturing and operations. Firstly, we need to look at the market trend and adjust our pro production line on demand. So let me give you an example. 
So the company this here is BYD, which is a Chinese electric car producers. Uh, once the uh, COVID strikes, the company utilized its own existing engineering team and also use its own existing facilities that are able to build the world's largest uh, face mask factory within one month. So one month is definitely some number you can talk about speed. So, and this will cause the company to need to have a collective uh, action and to do the agile supply reconfiguration. So when you do collective action, sometimes even you need to work with your supplier and supply suppliers to adjust your supply plan and production schedule. So this is a second, but I think DQ Twin will help here. So this is second one I'm talking about. The third one I want to talk about is the remapping the supply chain network by utilizing digital tools. So when you, once we have this digital twin of supply chain network, when there anything disruption happens, we can do the quick remap by taking into consideration like demand factors, supply risk factor, country regulation requirements, country incentives, geopolitic risk, trade or etc. Then through the remapping process, there are a few points I want to highlight is one, you need to identify where is your weakest link. So you need to build a profitable redundancy and diversification around your weakest link. So like building the safety stock, multi-sourcing from play, uh, partners located at different countries and regions. So let me give you one example of this company called Logo Nordisk. I'm not so sure you heard about it or not, but this is a company providing insulin. And this company is uh, actually keeping five year, five years safety stock for its key components. So, and then the second one is in the remapping process, we probably need to build capability for our creative component production. And I think one solution to it is 3D printing. And thirdly, for depends on industries. We know now still many uh, companies, uh, they, on the cost minimization, they do offshoring. But if you are, an industry and your product and component are strategically important, which we call strategic components of products, then rather than offshoring, you probably need to do the near showing or unshowing to focus on speed and responsiveness rather than the uh, efficiency. So then the first R I'm talking about. So second R I'm talking about is responsible, which is responsibility of the firm in the supply chain management. So we see today we see a big climate change, a change issue. And also with the growing population, there's more and more high uh, increasing demand for the resources, energy, water, et cetera. And to ensure the, our, the plant we are living can be sustainable, the company need to be responsible. So we need to comply with the ESG requirements by conducting sustainable operations. So and here, sustainable operations, we are going to focus on 4D. The first D we are talking about is decarbonization by uh, fighting against climate change and reduce the gas emission. So there's a company called uh, Pentagonia. This company actually uh, show you visually their supply chain carbon footprint uh, on their map. And the company is focusing on, you know, optimize their late work and utilizing new energy uh, techniques to reduce the carbon emission. And uh, in comply with ESG requirements, also think about sustainability can also mean some new business opportunity for our uh, world and firm. So one thing we know, uh, one big greenhouse gas emission contributor is actually the animal agriculture. Maybe you believe it a lot. So now more and more uh, socially environmental country consumers are on to switch to plant-based food. So the company, the Green Common, actually is the one providing the Omni food. And probably you know the Omni pork. So it's the one satisfy this niche market. And LG food is also a larger possible solution. And uh, uh, our GBA student, James Chang, is actually working and he founded this company he called uh, uh, Ioka is entry ING uh, plant product. So this is the one I'm talking about the compliance with the ESG requirements. Second one I'm talking about is uh, we need to focus on welfare improving on the top of profitability. So you need to care about the welfare of the internal employees, 
and also if you're a farming industry about the animals and etc. So the worker, uh, they so for in the COVID, definitely you are should allow the workers to have flexible working schedule, right, to work from home. And also we do should come a basic no not to hire workers under age. Recently, actually one very interesting story came to my mind is about uh, you know in the U.S. So this is a uh, Hyundai and the Alabama, you know, assembly plant. Uh, and this auto plant entry is found that they actually hire or employ the workers of children age 12. Uh, the reason just I mentioned is due to the shortage of the neighbors in the US during the COVID. And uh, so then they actually, so the children entry are from the immigrants to the US. So this is really a big warning sign to us. So this is definitely not some we're, uh, uh, welfare improving because company want to ensure the the profitability and smooth running, right? Second is you need to take a think, take into account the welfare of your partners or your suppliers. So we need to do like a fair trade. We need to do responsible sourcing. So company like Starbucks is one uh, pioneer in this field. In this, you know, spark, Starbucks like coffee, right? Bacon and coffee. So many of their suppliers are like uh, smallholder farmers in developing countries like Kenya. And the Starbucks is now to squeeze the profit out of the farmers rather than give the fair price to ensure their uh, their uh, partners of the smallholder farmers can have a decent life income. And certainly we need to consider the welfare of the customers. So when, when we do the supply chain, right, we, the supply chain shortage always will have a great impact on the consumer's emotion. In the COVID, you know, once it strike, many uh, consumers are panic buying various necessity goods. And those consumers may be buy more than they need while other consumers have no access. So importantly here, the companies should provide information to ease the customer's panic. You may still remember the toilet paper story in Hong Kong supermarket, because one day all the toilet paper were gone, right? Because people heard that there's no more supply. So the, the suppliers of the toilet paper in, in mainland China actually immediately announced uh, inf news and with a picture of their factory running to ease the consumer's panic. So this is something to be responsible to a society. And second, uh, in the COVID or in those uh, uh, safety health related products, when the product is in shortage, the responsible supply chain need to do how to allocate my infantry among different uh, downstream shareholders now here, probably you will take the take a consider your consumer's priority and to do the fair allocation. That's the second one I'm talking about welfare improving. Third one I want to talk about is the co uh, the, to be responsible. The supply chain partners need to have a collaborative sense. One is a collaborative with the government. So in the COVID, there's a big shortage of the equipment, medical equipment. So in the U.S., a company like Ford and GE is working with the federal uh, to produce the ventilator, which is something they never made before. So they have to learn from scratch. And But this is uh, for the society's benefit. Second one is uh, you may collaborate with your partner to ensure the viable operation of your supply chain, especially in the COVID, right? Which supplies will be affect the, the small one? While well, very vulnerable to a disruption, and then the focal firm in the supply chain network should step out, for example, offer some financial uh, supply chain finance to help them to you know, survive. And this can ensure the smooth operation of your supply chain. You can even collaborate with your competitor in certain uh, instances, so like knowledge sharing. So Elon Musk's company, Tesla, right, they actually open up their patents uh, about the uh, uh, about the battery production patents to the public. So rationally, uh, be behind such a knowledge sharing, is they want more uh, more uh, players into the electric car uh, this uh, sector to build reduce the uh, reduce the um, gas emission. So this I'm talking about this responsibility here. And third, R I'm going to talk about is uh, resilient. So again, resilient supply chain, we will look at uh, the uh, first of the business mode. So in the old mode, in our supply chain, normally traditional mode is we make, 
then we sell, then consumer buy and consume. This is a push mode. But now once we move to the digitalization and uh, then probably our production mode will, the business mode will switch to experience, consumer experience, then buy, then we make pool mode. And such kind of mode can better match supply with demand, also can help reduce the mismatch and the waste of materials and resources. And it can be done through utilizing the social platform, social media, uh, big data, AI, and VR to through personalized matching and personalized personalization. There's a company called Xi'in. Uh, actually, in Chinese, uh, the first name they call is Shang'in, but then they change it to Xi'in. I, I'm not so sure you know this company a lot. It's a company located in Shenzhen. It is a pure online fast fashion company. And it is only done digital marketing. And the company's value now is actually top HM and Zara combined. And Shein is offering the really kind of experience by make sort of mode, I should say in that sense, by offering on demand real fashion through the data analysis. The company doing text mining about the, they go to the social media like TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, et cetera to check the consumer's text message, uh, say they, what they like, they dislike, the color, it change, and they get some uh, and text out the useful information. They also uh, go to the third party data, like the Google trained finders, or even the comp competitors' websites to collect data, do the big data mining, and to, to do the uh, real on-demand function. So this is what I call the first resilience. The second one is uh, in the old supply chain, if you study supply chain management of property, we're talking about just-in-time supply chain. But COVID is a wake-up call, so wake up call in the sense that it tells us we should not just do just-in-time supply chain. We also consider just-in-case contingency plan. So we need to do the proactive and predictive sensing and reacting by through employing, uh, deploying things like sensors, Internet of Things, utilizing AI and machine learning, to do the better detection if anything wrong happens or pattern recreation, et cetera. And the third one, to be resilient, we also want to enhance, enhance our supply chain's traceability, audibility, and transparency. And one solution to it is blockchain technology. It is, has been implemented in certain industries like food, uh, medicine, vaccine, and Amazon recently also launched a blockchain program for its uh, furniture sellers in their platform. And it's through this, uh, and the good thing is about is it can enhance responsiveness of the supply chain as well, especially when something is run through the traceability, they can quickly trace back where is run, what's the problem, and to do the precision recall management. It can also enhance the trust between the supply chain partners and also with the customers. So one big player in the food blockchain is IBM. So IBM has an IBM Food Trust blockchain. Now many companies has a, a uses this platform, such as Verma, Lestony, and Unilever. They and their suppliers, the food suppliers, all on the chain to enhance the traceability, transparency, and audibility. Then last one I want to talk about is to be resilient. Operational side, we need to do the smart operations. So by a smart manufacturing, smart warehousing, smart logistics, etc. By utilizing technology like Industry 4.0, in the meantime, it also requires us to do the business process re-engineering to map with our technology implementation to improve the channel's efficiency. So that's the three R's I want to talk about. Uh, thank you. So I think that's all I want to share. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for Professor Yunnan Wang uh, giving us uh, the presentation. Uh, well, on the other hand, I uh, can add one more book into my uh, reading list, okay? Um, well, if any audience have questions, again, uh, please send me or administrator a note. Uh, thanks for our distinguished speakers uh, who gave us uh, such excellent sharing. It is time uh, to open the floor to questions, all right? Let me take a look to um, questions raised by our audience today. We have got a few questions uh, from the floor to our speakers. 
All right. The first question is to uh, Dr. Manat uh, Kukani. Uh, the first question is, you have shared a lot of tips and experience in managing supply chains in the VUCA world. What is your golden rule of thumb amongst the many tips and strategies? Um, well, your turn. Good question, because uh, as I explained, it's so complex and I think uh, Dr. Wang also just uh, showed us the other side uh, current situation and uh, multi-dimensional complex situation. But still, I will say if only one word I have to say, I will say speed or time because uh, how you time, how you manage the time. For example, it's a uh, data, real time data. Do you have if you are in production, tag time, how you are managing tag time, service. It's the on-time delivery. Uh, just now I uh, saw in the slide that just in time and just in case, these two things also. So everything is a flow. And then how you manage the flow is most critical thing. And there are different factors affecting. And you have to, as uh, just now Madam said, you have to react it, resilience, responsive and all. But the one word is speed or time. That's what I think. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks for your answer. Uh, JIT, just in time, okay? I still remember the keyword, okay? All right, um, let me see uh, the second question. Um, it is the question to uh, Professor Wang. As a result of the COVID disruption, do you see a new area or growth in certain areas in supply chain management related research? What are the reasons for the new area uh, or the growth. All right, uh, Professor Huang. Okay, uh, thank you, Derek. Um, very good question. Uh, so COVID-19 actually bring a lot of new research opportunity to our field. So in our field, the old research, if you think about in the supply chain operations management, we are either think about from the manufacturing side is cost minimization or the profit maximization. That's how we do. However, COVID really gave us another angle is we are not just looking at cost and the profit. We need to take risk into our objective function when we do the optimization. So such as the uh, response time, need time issue, right? Also the fluid infant availabilities. So then, so, so now we actually, when we do the make the design, we will take those uh, constraints into our optimization model. So now if you find in our research, now people talking about robust sourcing. Robust sourcing means uh, our sourcing strategy is robust to the like, to like, you know, disruption. We can bounce back quickly and re rerun, reconfigure. So there's a robust uh, sourcing, robust supply chain network configuration. The word robust itself means we need to be taking the disruption and into the contingency plan. So that's the one I can see. A lot of things that we're doing is the, is the data. Now we have a lot of data. So how to use data to help with the decision makers, managers uh, uh, to like the JD, you know, supply chain department, right? To make the uh, quicker, uh, I mean, better decisions. So now data-driven analysis is also another hot area in our research area. All right, thanks. Um, well, time, timeliness, data. All right, okay, thanks. <laughs> Um, let's see uh, other questions. Again, uh, it is the question to uh, Dr. Kukami. Uh, how do you see the continuous advancement of information technologies such as AI, artificial intelligence, help supply chain professionals in their work? Dr. Mm, Kukami? Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, this is again good question and just now madam mentioned data and i will try to share one thing in our company also now recently i started to handle asia supply chain and uh, in that we have started specifically data driven supply chain sessions every week with the team and whole approach how to look at data now coming to your uh, uh, 
artificial intelligence or digitization how to use so one part i mentioned is the flow or uh, time part another thing the knowledge management how you acquire knowledge how you use knowledge and how you share knowledge all these things are very critical and i think everyone may be knowing data data to be transferred into information information to knowledge knowledge to decision and this process again i generally when i started digitalization four or five years back in our company for supply chain divided into three groups one is the data just now madam also mentioned importance and there is a complexity in the vuca thing complexity can be taken care if you do the data analytics properly for that you can use your digitization information technology then second part is process how you process the thing business processes have to be changed you are doing lot of manual processes which will be changed to digital there are skills are required and all but ambiguity can be taken care of if you do the business process properly and again you can take help of artificial intelligence rpas and all and the third part is systems like a system like a erp system supply management system supplier portal communication system again you can take help of digitization and artificial intelligence to further also if you have enough data and that will help you for volatility so so your question artificial intelligence or digitization artificial intelligence really can help to take care of this book cover because all these are there then definitely your uncertainty is the thing you cannot control to some extent because you don't know tomorrow what is going to happen what but at least you take care of this parameter three things then uncertainty you can react you can react to that with three hours and this artificial intelligence setup you have so i think analytics is more critical and my experience the data is very bad you go to many companies maybe 60 years old company 100 years old or let us and all one thing is data is bad incomplete and second thing the data availability is not in the form the system requires people think i have all the data but when you have to convert into the digital format you require data in a different way so that's the another aspect you have to take care before you will go to digitization and next stage is anyway artificial intelligence thank you uh, it seems that uh, both of uh, our distinguished uh, guest speakers are telling us uh, similar stories uh, say uh, talking about when talking about data now uh, dr tani uh, talk about say like uh, more than data and uh, we also need uh, analytics right okay that's good all right uh, let me see uh, another questions um okay the question is to uh, professor wang okay if we are to prepare for the next major disruption would you like to recommend some subject domains which our supply chain management professionals should enhance their knowledge in uh, may we have uh, professor yunnan wang uh, to answer this question uh, okay uh, thanks derek uh, so for this question um i think uh, uh, i will Put on the top of the Manoy or Dr. Kirkani's comments about the process re-engineering, which I also mentioned in the last slides. So, so you see the disruption has a very big impact on the supply chain, deep tiering system. So, how to bounce back? You need to have some like bottleneck uh, analysis, a process view. So, if for the students, uh, I think uh, for the all the main, uh, managers, also that's my very very personal view. I should know something about operations management. And since you should have idea of the process view, you should know how to do the bottleneck analysis. So then I would recommend that you definitely, this is for internal management. You should have those kind of things. Uh, so then to help you to identify the weak link in your company, right? Or you can apply it to the network, identify the weak link, and then you build, as I say, you build a profitable diversification uh, or redundancy around it. So the cost in operation management, especially the knowledge about process management and the bottleneck analysis, I think are very important. Uh, second one, uh, but across the 
organization be changing organizations i think some knowledge about global international operations is important as a uh, manoy show you a lot of pictures uh, which uh, actually some i taught in my class before i teach international operations you need to look at about the i think a uh, cost if you just look at supply chain itself the cost is actually a minimum a bigger cost a picture the total cost is actually about the government policy you know, the how geopolitic risk, all those enter a higher picture. So students should have a higher um, comprehensive picture. So I think some knowledge about global operations, you know, the flows across the borders, you know, the taxation duties, tariffs, uh, logistics terms and the uh, policy regulations. So those are the help you because risk is not just disruption. We have all kinds of risks in our society. We have to fight and disrupting just one of it. So global operations courses will help you to have a better picture about the factors, issues you will face when you have a global supply chain. So that's a second thing I, I want to talk about. And certainly, uh, if there you have time, I will recommend you, right? As you, again, I want to, on the top of the curriculum is, uh, you know, the slides about long lead time and transportation time, very long lengthy. So because uh, once we have across borders, uh, the transportation, logistics, and shipping become actually a very big, important player in our chain. So some knowledge about this are also important as well. So that's is some things I think if you have time, I would recommend you to, you know, strengthen your expertise in these areas. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks for the information. Uh, it is very useful for all of us. I think uh, our participants like that. All right. All right. Um, well, since uh, we have a uh, little bit of time, I uh, think uh, we need to uh, make a close to today's event. We are close to the end of today's event. And I think this opportunity, I would like to remind that uh, this scholar leaders webinar event is organized by uh, the Doctor of Business Administration uh, program of the Hong Kong Polytechnic University co-organizer is the PolyU DBA Alumni Association Limited. If you want to understand more about DBA program, please visit our uh, PolyU website. All right. I would like to close my remarks and officially announce the end of today's event. All right. Thanks for your time and uh, participation today, and uh, hope to see you uh, in our coming uh, webinar sooner or later. All right. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thank Bye. you. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.